Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, John Richards. I was an ophthalmologist here for, for several years. Uh, this is a part, uh, the second part of the talk on the 250 years of healthcare in uh, Plymouth, New Hampshire. I also wish to thank the uh, audiovisual techniques and, and skill being used by the Pemmy Baker TV channel. Uh, and my association with the Plymouth Historical Society and the talk that was given with Dr. Uh, Doug McVicker on December 12, 2018. I really enjoyed Doug's talk um, and every time I am seeing it and hearing it, I continue to learn more and, and understand how his, uh, his picture frame uh, discussion he mentioned fits very, very well uh, into my content. Our studies were independent of each other, and you will, however, hear many times my comments reflecting exactly what Doug was, was mentioning. So, here we go. How many hospitals have we had in Plymouth, and where were they? What happened to them? Who were the major players? How many doctors were there? What services were available? How many beds or how many rooms? What fascinating stories are there? What have been the trends in surgery, medical care, emergency care, specialty care? How many of you grew up here? Did your grandparents live here? Well, This is Your Life um, was a TV show which ran from 1952 to 61. And Spear Memorial Hospital, This is Your Life. I want to share some of my journey as I have learned so much about the hospitals, the personnel, the leadership, the town of Plymouth, and its citizens. Please note, this is still a work in progress, with more to discover and incorporate. We encourage you to let us know of any additions or corrections. Hospital number one, Emily Balch, Cottage Hospital, 1899 to 1908, nine years. Cottage today means regional. It was meant to serve the five towns of Ashland, Holiness, Campton, Rumney, and Plymouth. The census at that time was 5,800 people serving these five towns in 1900. The nearest hospital was in Concord in 1892, but as Doug mentioned, by 1897 things were happening. Well, in fact, there were small cottage hospitals in both Lincoln and Laconia. Reverend Lewis Balch moved with his family of 10 to Holiness in 1871, buying the Samuel Livermore Estate, living at a home called the Woodlands, which is located near the current chapel and the Connell Dormitory. Upon his death, four years later in 1875, some of the, of the estate was sold to help create the Holiness School for Boys in 1879. One of their sons, Ernest, the sixth born, founded Chicago Island Chapel Association on Chicago Island, Big Squam Lake, Holiness, which is today's Church Island. Their daughter, Catherine Holm Balch, the third born, became the driving force for improved health care. She realized by 1891 that there was a need for a hospital, and she pressed her case to Thomas Walker, the editor of the Plymouth Record, and its readership by urging the town to, quote, Try it for a year." End quote. The paper's editor printed both pro and con letters, but, were pers well, was, but was personally in favor of it, as were the majority of the writers. For example, Dr. Tristram Rogers in 1893 stated in the paper, quote, being on a hill with free access to light and air can never be interfered with. End quote. Furthermore, he went on to say, quote, I shall look forward with pleasure to the day when I can congratulate the people of Plymouth in the position of an institution." End quote. Dr. Haven Palmer was concerned about our exposure to diseases arising from, quote, railways and personal liberty, end quote, like smallpox, diphtheria, scarlet fever, and typhoid fever. But he felt there was a big advantage having a cottage hospital available to help isolate the patient and prevent these contagious diseases from spreading through the public. Therefore, uh, in 1896, $700 was raised. Four patients were treated in the home of Mrs. Caleb Ames in Holderness. 
In very early 1899, the Emily Balch Cottage Hospital Association of 13, quote, progressive people, end quote, in Plymouth and Holiness was formed, including her sister-in-law, Elizabeth Singerly Balch. It was named after her mother, Emily, who had died in 1891. There were five board members. After receiving a gift of 500, putting down 600, and a mortgage of 900 at 5%, allowed them to purchase a two-story Noah Cummings house on 37 Highland Street. By the way, in two, 2019 adjusted dollar value is approximately 29 to 1, thus the total house purchase considering the gift, the down payment, and the mortgage is about $58,000. It was a second house in from Langdon Street at today's Belknap Hall and across from the current Museum of the White Mountains, which is at 34 Highland Street. The Museum of the White Mountains becomes a very easy point of reference as we look at this uh, town at this time frame. From the formation of the board to the house purchase took less than one month and only six months to be treating patients. So what's so hard about health care? Remember, one family over a 20-year span, the Balches, gave us a school, an iconic island church, and a hospital. The Chicago Island Chapel Association continued their yearly donations to all the hospitals. There were six rooms upstairs at this uh, Cummings house with a woman's ward and a man's ward. There was a resident nurse had a third room. There was a small waiting room. The pantry became the drug room and the kitchen doubled as both the kitchen and the operating room. There was also a shed that housed more drugs. The downstairs was rented out at $7 a month. One such renter was a board member, Mrs. Tupper and her husband who had been disabled from the Civil War. There is no telephone or electricity for years. The Plymouth and Campton Telephone Exchange Company had only 500 homes supplied at this time. Therefore, kerosene lamps were used after dark. Patients paid $10.50 a week, hopefully at the start of the week. Visitors were only allowed on Thursdays. Miss Jones was the first nurse, having completed a three-year course in Waltham, Mass. With a year in each area of hospital service, midwifery, and district or home nursing. But she also did the laundry, the cooking, and was available um, for all the patients 24-7. Initially, it was considered better to have a live-in nurse as, quote, a constant change of nurses is not soothing to a patient, end quote. When possible, she also made house or district calls in all weathers, all seasons, often walking miles a day. For all this effort, she got paid a grand total of $10 a week. And district or house calls were 50 cents. Those families had to help with care under her supervision. Understandably, it was very difficult and Miss Jones had to be talked out of quitting a few times. In the first six months, she had four, eight, four inpatients, 11 outpatients, and some volunteers are helping with now the laundry and the cooking, including Catherine Balch. Numerous fundraisers and private donations helped to fill the crucial needs organized by the Association. Catherine urged the hospital must care for the railroad, the lumber, and the farming injuries, the sick and neglected children, the Holden School for Boys, and often the mothers and wives, so that their men could continue working. The hospital was, was responsible for railroad care within 10 miles of all these towns. The association hired two physicians in January. Uh, 8, 1900, so the actual care began, began in 1900. Dr. Haven Palmer from Jefferson, New Hampshire, 
finished his training at Bowdoin Medical College and came to Plymouth in 1883 doing surgery and medical care. Dr. John Wheeler from Alton, New Hampshire, finished his training at Dartmouth Medical College in 1898, coming here very shortly thereafter with a family practice background. There are other doctors in the area, including Dr. William Garland, who actually lives right across the street to the left uh, on uh, Rogers Street here. Russell Street, sorry. Um, also, there was Dr. Alonzo Muchmore, Tristram Rogers, on the, on, he was on the original association board, and Enos Huckins. Dr. Muchmore, Rogers, and Huckins were all eclectic physicians, which were common then and similar to today's naturopathic uh, medicine. By 1905, 54 patients were treated as inpatients, and my favorite story of all time takes place during this early time frame and will be put off until the end of my talk. The house was sold to help finance for the next hospital in 15, uh, for $1,500. Now, Catherine passed away on September 29, 1932 at Laconia Hospital of a heart attack. Her death certificate has several errors, including her middle name, her date of birth, her father's birthplace, and her occupation. Since she never married, her occupation was listed, as was common at that time frame, as spinster. Today, she would qualify as activist, board member, etc. Also, interestingly for historians, her birthplace was at Leetown, Virginia in 1854. That was located in the northwestern portion of Virginia that eventually seceded from the Confederacy, forming West Virginia in the time frame from 1861 to 1863, when the legalities were finally finished. Hospital number two, Emily Balsh Cottage Hospital, 1908 to 1916, eight years. Dr. Ernest Bell, pictured here, came to Plymouth in 1906. He had gone to Harvard undergrad and then Dartmouth Medical College, graduating in 1894, moving to Lincoln, starting his first hospital in 1897, caring for the mill workers for the next nine years. Again, that preceded Plymouth's um, hospital. He relocated to Plymouth, living on the beautiful Maple at Elm Line, Highland Street, number 32, um, it was sandwiched between the old Highland Avenue on this side or the east side and by the Museum of the White Mountains on the west side. It was at the same numerical address where the Curtin Norton Bagley building is currently uh, being uh, rehabbed. Um, and uh, on the 1910 census, which is shown here, you'll see his name listed under number 32. But it also appears, Doug had actually found this, that he had a coachman at the same address. Was this also his transportation for house calls? Maybe surgery? Interesting. Every morning from 1906 to 1908, he would finish his breakfast, walk out to the front porch, and he would look across slightly to, the, to his right, and on the other side of the street was the functioning first hospital. These hospitals were only two blocks apart, and so he would turn right and, and walk down to the private hospital at his at 65 Highland Street. He named this hospital the Barry E. Loud, L-O-U-D, Memorial Hospital after his mother. The hospitals were, again, were two blocks apart at the corner of Avery and Highland Street where the current Plymouth General Dentistry is located. I could not find any documentation anywhere about the floor plan of this hospital. But imagine the stress and competition this created. Listen to the biographical picture here is, and that's a long list of the many, many organizations uh, that this man got involved with. He was also involved with the um, Pillsbury Hospital in, in Concord. Uh, he was a physician for all kinds of groups. He even served a term in the state representative uh, and later on one term as, as a state senator. 
But also listed there is a biographical note about his um, being associated with the Holiness School for Boys, which actually predated his moving to Plymouth by several months. The realities of 1906 medicine was the eventuality of problems that could occur. That year, January 1906, he attended a 14-year-old student from the uh, school. It had a skating in injury lacerating his thigh. Chloroform anesthesia was given by mask, probably the safest anesthesia we had at that point. And eventually, the athletic director had to administer more because of the patient's mobility, and the man died at 14 years of age. Dr. Bell was found negligent and careless in not monitoring the further use of anesthetic while he was still operating until it was too late. We had no malpractice insurance at that time, so he was fined $1,500, which is today a little bit over $42,000. In today's medicine, we have an abundance of having not only the surgeon, but we have the assistant surgeon. We have a scrub nurse that handles all the sterile instruments and helps to transfer all that back and forth with the, with the surgeon. We have a circulating nurse that takes care of all the other things that happen in the OR uh, from making phone calls to getting out uh, packs of other instruments that are requested, uh, interfacing with radiology, laboratory, whatever. And we also have, most importantly, um, is, is an anesthetic provider. And we have much safer uh, anesthetics today. So in general, it really amazes me how good the care was considering how thin was the safety net at that time frame. For you to be basically on your own handling everything, dealing with a patient and all the potential things that can happen, and you can't predict any of it ahead of time. It's, uh, it's really amazing how well they did. Okay, the Emily Balsh Cottage Hospital Association in 1908 made the bold decision to buy out Dr. Bell's larger three-story hospital that had more land for expansion and was at a higher elevation for improved light and ventilation. And as the picture will show, um, the, also the side view of that hospital going along Avery Street, um, it was a much more sizable house and, and hospital than what the original picture from this angle would project. The, uh, they started a nursing school, graduating four nurses with some who actually married local Plymouth men. The Plymouth Water Works drawing of this lot uh, shows a location of the hospital. And the hospital's foundation and attached barn was certainly part of our current three hospital parking lots along Avery Street. If you walk the 600 feet down Avery Street and look to your left, the southerly border would pass very near to the heliport and certainly uh, pass the emergency department. It took up a huge space. Importantly, the second hospital had both electricity and phone service. The first hospital, remember, only two blocks away, still had none of either. Room rates had increased from the first hospital's $10.50 a week to now 15 up to $21 a week. Six more association members were appointed and there were 108 admissions, 34 operations, 11 accidents and 115 district calls in that first year alone in 1908. So the work had more than doubled in part due to 48 lumbermen injuries with their associated 501 hospital days in that first year. Remember, lumbering was a big business during this time frame. It was requested for more rooms and bed to be made to handle this kind of a load. And they also wanted to have improved kitchen facilities to avoid six round trips a day for each patient, carrying the meals up and down, potentially three floors. The active medical staff now had Drs. Haven Palmer, John Wheeler, Ernest Bell, and William Garland. Dr. Garland 
whose house again is right over there, uh, was from Thornton and graduated from the Holden School for Boys and the Dartmouth Medical College. The associate staff added doctors from Warren, Wentworth, Lincoln, and Meredith. Some of the advantages of having more physicians on staff allowed for an assistant surgeon or with uh, anesthesia delivery. And care was now expanding to now nine towns. After eight years of being a hospital, a fire broke out at the base of the chimney on February 29, 1916. When the hand extinguishers couldn't control it, a call was made to the fire department on Main Street. Those hose carts had to be hauled up by hand in the winter on Highland Street. There were two blessings, however. First, there were 17 patients. They were all evacuated safely. Did they have fire drills back then? I doubt it. The second, the town insisted there be modern pumps to, to be placed on Highland Street. This was accomplished in 1919 by putting a hose tower at the same spot where the future wooden firehouse from 1937 and the current brick fire department was built in 1969 at 42 Highland Street. The worst problem was the resultant loss of hospitals for five years. Fortunately, Dr. Bell opened his home to treat patients. Other physicians, eclectic physicians, and mis midwives helped as well. Mrs. Nate Smith on Ward Hill had a, quote, maternity hospital, end quote, that helped care for female patients. There is no doubt that this hospital was, or this house was a hospital in its own right. It definitely existed and functioned as such, but it was not one of the Balch hospitals. After the fire, Dr. Bell joined, the World, uh, joined World War I in the Army, eventually becoming, not surprised, a major in charge of a 2,500-bed hospital in France. When he returned in 1919, he reopened a new office at 174 Main Street and died in 1925 at his fishing camp on Newfound Lake. The space on uh, Main Street, which eventually became one of my favorite pizza parlors, um, also housed uh, later on the offices for do Dr. Samuel Finer, Lyle Milton, and Reginald DeWitt. Hospital number three. Long name, the Emily Balch and Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hospital, also known as the Plymouth Memorial Hospital. This was 30 years, from 1921 to 1951. So in 1919, a branch of the American Legion was started in Plymouth, and they urged a tribute to the soldiers and sailors who'd fought in the Great War and to change the name of the hospital to reflect it. The town voted accordingly in August of 1919 to donate $3,500 to build a third hospital, becoming the Emily Balch and Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hospital. A plaque was to be placed bearing the names of all soldiers and sailors from the town of Plymouth all the way back to 1860. This is when we acquired the name Memorial. The 1920 census was now pushing 9,000. There is a strong commitment with Campton and Plymouth to reestablish a hospital with concessions and compromises since it would straddle both towns. After studying options, $8,000 was used to purchase the 40-acre Charles Schofield property, which was also the prior home of Moses Little from, 18, uh, from 1786 and Justice Arthur Livermore in 1827. He was also the Livermore of Livermore Falls fame. 37 of the 40 acres was located in Plymouth. It was chosen because of a very solid foundation that did not freeze and had a double thickness wooden floor structure for a warmer and quieter interior. That was the reason why this hospital was placed and chosen there. It was furthermore, it was on a bluff above the river for, again, fresh air and better drainage. It was on the town line with Campton, which ran through the three-story building diagonally, leaving a portion of the 
east or the back side of the hospital to the south side or the right side that was in Plymouth. So the vast majority of this hospital was in Campton. The basement had the power plant and the laundry. The first floor had x-ray, laboratory, office, and some patient rooms. The operating room and delivery rooms were on the second floor. There was a two-story southern uh, extension called the L, E-L-L, that had rooms for nurses' living quarters. The kitchen was just as you entered the L. I also saw another reference for a, a kitchen that was associated in the barn that was off to the fur farthest uh, southern portion of it. The people embraced it, the medical staff expanded, the technology improved, and the funding with the Ladies Aid Society programs helped. And this was the first hospital in Plymouth to be certified by the American Hospital Association and opened on January 20, 1921. The association grew rapidly to 145 members as they helped to renovate the old wooden house into a functioning up-to-date hospital. Rummage sales, bazaars, plays, concerts, operas, bequests, etc. helped to fund the facilities. The Red Cross donated an x-ray machine. Ten private rooms were furnished by individuals, companies, and organizations. Other rooms were furnished by the Active Ladies Society. Plans were made for a maternity ward, six rooms for a staff, a sleeping and sun porch for patients, therapy, in 1924. So the following year, both an elevator was purchased and installed, a maternity ward was created on the third floor of the house, and according to prior nurses, a patient could request their child to be born in either town since the line went right through the delivery room. There are reports from reputable sources that the orientation of the bed could even be changed depending on which town they chose. This is an example of the cooperation between the two towns. Thus, there are records showing Campton residents having one child born in Campton and another child be born in Plymouth, but in the same hospital. And these can easily be seen when you go to the town reports at, those, uh, at that time frame and looking to see what towns were births being registered in. A first report book, let, little booklet, reviewed the statistics and the patient outcomes over a three-year period from 1921 to 1924. This is one that's being shown here. It is stunning in its details of what went on in those walls. 100 years ago, the same categories that must be in our current medical record were required at that same time. Dr. William Garland was the president of medical staff for the first 15 years, from 1921 to 1935 when he passed away. He had been an exemplary physician and a, coll and a colleague of Dr. Bell from that era. The only local physician oversight, very common thing we're always concerned about today, consisted of only the hospital superintendent that was usually the head nurse. It delved into the difficulties of financing medical care. They wanted a permanent trust fund to help defer the cost when patients couldn't pay for their care and or requesting each town to donate and raise taxes to support the hospital. They gave, quote, each patient the best that can be obtained with home-like surroundings and clean, wholesome food. Cream, milk, and butter were raised upon the farm connected to the hospital." End quote. They sold a horse for $150 and contributed $50 towards their first ambulance in 1922. Growth continued for the rest of the 1920s and through the Depression over a 15-year period from 24 to 39 they had gone from seven up to now 12 physicians and 28 beds initially up to a total of 40 with uh, six of those being maternity beds on the third floor. They also had seven bassinets. 
This booklet records numerous statistics of all kinds of care from cradle to grave. It's remarkable in the type and the degree of difficulty and the cases handled by all physicians. And there's still some who remember this hospital. The Emily Balsh and Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hospital plaque is now located in the solarium on the second floor at the hospital above the lobby showing the administrative names and those who helped to pave the way. Please stop and review it. There is a monument outside our town hall that commemorates World War I, and there is a 1929 plaque from this committee that does list 85 soldiers and sailors' names, but I cannot locate it anywhere. Please note that both of Dr. Bell's um, sons Leslie and, and Ernest Jr. also were with him um, in World War I and uh, are listed in this uh, little booklet. So what became of his hospital after Spear Memorial Hospital opened? It first became a motel and then a patent museum and it burned down in 1974. The former Wilson Tire business was located here. And this is a picture of Dr. Reginald DeWitt, who joined in 1936. And one story about him relates to the hurricane of 1938. After four days of rain in September, um, resulted in a full force hurricane arriving the evening of the 21st into the 22nd with winds exceeding 70 miles an hour. The tree warden in Plymouth in 1900 had counted about 700 trees within our town borders. And we lost a sizable number of our shade trees, the maples and the elms, um, especially around the common and going up Highland Street, totally changing uh, the appearance and, and um, the structure of, of the town. There is a substantial destruction to homes, businesses, telephone wires, poles, and forests. We were certainly were without any phone service for quite a while. One of the most iconic images of rural health care in bygone times was the struggle of a doctor in the country trying to reach his patient and using a horse or a buggy to try to reach somebody in, in need. Well, do meet Dr. Reginald DeWeet. DeWitt, who had arrived here in 1936 to practice medicine, do surgery. So two years later, he was attempting to get to a lady in labor in Bridgewater. And at the height of the storm coming in at 5 p.m., he got a call that she was uh, in labor and needed help. After four days of rain and downed trees, the road was impassable for a car. So he got the help from a Walter Adams who brought two horses and off they rode. They rode for 18 miles and then ran into a horrible washout and he had to hike the final two miles to get to Mrs. Dow's house in time to deliver the baby boy at 1 a.m. having again started at 5 p.m. Okay, hospital number four. Siva Spear Memorial Hospital, 1951 to the present. By the mid to late 1930s, we're still dealing with the third hospital at this time frame. Remember that one finally stops in 51, so we're dealing with the last years of the third hospital. By the mid to late, teen, by, by the mid to late 1930s, people realized that there, there were growth restraints of the hospital with increased equipment requests, more patients, more physicians, and the concern about another hospital fire that they all remembered from 1916. There was also a change in patient attitudes from home-based care to access to hospital care. It became easier to come to the facility having the doctors and the technology available to treat them. Mr. Siva Spear entered the picture and helped to change our health care forever. He had been a clerk at the old Russell store that preceded our Plymouth Post Office's current location. He really did love Plymouth. 
After he had a successful banking and business career in Asheville, he came here in 1940 to visit a friend in the hospital. He felt there was a need for improvement and spoke with others. If the town could raise 50000 then he would match that amount and build a new hospital for the $100,000. And estimates seemed to concur that that would be enough to build a new hospital. And it was to be constructed on the same property in the Campton, Plymouth, town line area. The association voted in August 1, 1941, four months before Pearl Harbor, to approve his offer. After three weeks, um, the name of the corporate hospital was now Siva Spear Memorial Hospital. And if you observe the photograph outside the laboratory at the hospital, you will see the old wooden hospital being called a new name. This really is a neat picture. I really like this time frame. Initially, I, I thought it was a mistake that somebody had labeled the wrong name to the, to the right hospital. But in fact, you can directly date what time frame that took place from. With World War II, the project had to be postponed, but plans and committees continued. Higher operation of costs due to higher cost of living, hiring more nurses and staff and outstanding accounts. People had a harder time paying. Uh, land acquisition restraints um, and the physical condition of the wooden building was becoming more of a problem. There were a lot of times of red ink on the financial reports. It added urgency to find suitable land to build a new hospital. In 1946, three sites were evaluated, and the current one obviously met the best criteria. The big change, however, was with changing times and construction methods, it was decided to leave the old wooden hospital, the fresh air concepts, etc., and use brick and mortar and the new concept of HVAC. HVAC came into being. Now, the Hill Burton, B U R T O N, Hospital Surveying Construction Act was passed by Congress and signed by President Truman in 1946. Taking advantage of this opportunity, the association for the first time made an application for federal aid in 1948. But to qualify for this federal grant, they would be required to comply with certain standards like making care available without regard to race, color, or national origin. And a certain amount of free care would have to be provided to the indigent. The association calculated that even with the federal aid, it would still now need to raise an additional $150,000. The association voted in their largest board of 24 members, assigned to numerous committees to steer the gathering momentum. Public meetings were held to engage the communities. The original Ladies' Aid Society that had served the previous three hospitals was transformed into the Women's Hospital Auxiliary, now enlisting 267 members from 12 towns, raising $67,000 more than the $50,000 that Siva Spear had required. They truly did go door to door. Fundraisers included the Pemiquani uh, Riding Club auction, concerts, a week long county fair, street dancing, um, arts and crafts, and Donations, pledges, bequests. The contract was awarded to a T.W. Cunningham Company in Bangor, Maine for $523,000, of which $175,000, or one-third, was from the federal government. The construction started in October 1949. Dedication was 20 months later and on May 2, 1951. This hospital did receive the Hospital of the Month Award from the American Hospital Association. The medical staff now had doctors John Archibald, Reginald DeWitt, uh, Samuel Finer, Fred McIver, Lyle Middleton, Shirley Olmsted, Leon Orton, Harold Palmer. He was the son of the very first physician from the first hospital, and he practiced on uh, South Maine and we had four additional people on the associate staff. 
Soon to arrive were Drs. Henry Crane, Alistair Craig, Eugenia Kirkhermy, and William Thompson. We now had 50 beds, a children's ward, a maternity ward, and a nurse's station on the second floor. The first floor had the ER, surgery, pharmacy, radiology, kitchen, lobby, business offices, the heating plant, and administration. The original 1951 hospital had 52,000 square feet, 52,000. In the last 67 years, there have been eight major projects, essentially tripling our footprint to 152,000 square feet. Not bad for a dream that Catherine Balsh had nearly 130 years ago. So, so much for physical structures and their location. What about the major health trends? How about comparisons of 1900 to 1960? In 1900, less than 5% of people smoked. 1960, 42%. In 1900, there were very few cars anywhere, so people walked, drove buggies, rode horses, took trains, or even, believe it or not, the remaining stagecoach lines. The roads, bicycles, and cars were lacking any reliable technology or maintenance. By 1960, cars, of course, were everywhere. In 1900, we were more physical with family farm work, logging in our region, walking to do just about everything. By 1960, we were becoming more sedentary in both work and leisure. In 1900, nutrition was pure but minimal. Actually, believe it or not, after World War I, there was a diet called the starvation diet. In 1960, we already had high fructose corn syrup and many processed foods like margarine. In 1900, the top four causes of death were all contagious diseases. The top four, including pneumonia, influenza, tuberculosis, and gastrointestinal diseases, especially cholera and typhoid associated with diarrhea. By 1960, totally different landscape. Now we're dealing with heart disease and cancer accounting for almost 47% of the deaths. By the way, TB was such a major issue. In 1924, remember that first report booklet? 1924, there were 6,000 cases in New Hampshire of TB, with upwards of 350 people dying from it. The presence of the contagious diseases, as described above, kept life expectancy low. In 1900, you were lucky if you were a man to hit 47. Women, you could get to 49. By 1960, despite our rotten bad habits, life expectancies had now risen about 20 plus years. Men, 67. Women, 74. And this was in due to new medications, sanitation, including cleaner drinking water, technology, vaccinations, and so on. One final story. This, if I had to pick one story to tell from all the research over this last year, I would like it to be about one person who was a participant and a witness to all four hospitals in Plymouth. It would require one to be alive in 1900 and again to participate and to be fortunate enough to have a long life. And if that famous radio newsman Paul Harvey could tell it, this would be one he'd end up with, quote, and now you know the rest of the story, end quote. This true story begins in 1900 or 1901. This is a drama unfolding of a surgeon battling many changes, excuse me, many challenges. You are operating on an elderly lady with an abdominal mass in the kitchen. You are running out of ether. You have no electricity. You have no phone to call for help. You have no assistant surgeon. You have no anesthesia services. You have no circulating nurse. Your instruments are not of today's quality. You have no CT, MRI, x-rays, laboratory, and you're assisted by a relatively new nurse trying her hardest. Oh, did I forget to mention you're running out of daylight. 
Soon you'll be in the dark with a patient waking up. Fortunately, a young volunteer lady about 24 years of, old, uh, of age is out in the waiting room. You yell for her help. She is told to go to the pantry. And on the upper shelf is another container of ether. Get it now. She brings it in and hands it off. But wait. Now she has to find and bring in the kerosene lantern. And remember, ether is flammable. She is worried about fainting. You yell at her that, no, you cannot faint. And she has to hold the lantern over the operating field closer and closer as the light is fading fast. Well, fortunately, the surgery was successful, but Miss Jones, our scrub nurse, has now fainted due to exhaustion. So now our young volunteer lady has to clean up the room and the bloody instruments. When she returned home and told her father about the ordeal, he was irate. And yes, the unknown lady did live out the rest of her years in Campton. Now fast forward to this young lady's marriage on New Year's Eve 1912. Her husband will play a major role for our current fourth hospital as a chairman of the funding committee. Later, she will have two children, a son born in 1917 and a daughter born in 1915. Any guesses yet? Well, here's the rest of the story. The star of the story is Bessie Fox. She was born in 1877 and was 24 at the time of the above event and 35 when she got married. Her father was Plummer Fox, a very prominent businessman in town. In fact, our current Fox Block and Park and Pond were all named after him. Bessie's husband was Harl P. Sr., who was a committee chairman for the hospital drive. Their son was obviously Harl P. Jr., who died in World War II, receiving Our Town's only Congressional Medal of Honor and Distinguished Flying Cross for his actions near Ray Ball, in the South Pacific in 1942. The former uh, Pease Air Force Base is named for him. Her daughter was Charlotte Pease, who died in, in 1982 and has done so much for our area institutions, especially the local Pease Library and Spear Memorial Hospital. So here we have an amazing story of one person and her family spanning the entire life of our four hospitals. And with that, I conclude and thank you for all your attention and especially enjoying the assistance with uh, Doug McVicker. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Don't remember who done it. <laughs> <laughs>